Good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak very briefly in part because Rob did such a good job of providing the context for this. And I know Misty Chase will speak very compellingly about how these things actually work in real world America. But I just want to share a couple, a couple key messages for you. First, despite the fact that we live in a country where technology is nearly ubiquitous, certainly here in Washington and on Capitol Hill, people are walking around with you know, pretty much every pocket filled with some device. That isn't the case all over America. And in fact, there are still 30 million American households that don't have computers in them. Um, so the need case is very clear, and I want to share a little bit about that. I also want to share what the opportunity is and then talk briefly about the consequences of actually not taking action. In terms of the need, I think Congressman Larson and, and Rob Shapiro, who in my opinion is one of the best economists practicing and, and writing and thinking right now, framed very compellingly the changes in our workforce and in our increasingly technology-rich, knowledge-based economy. What I see every day in the work that one economy does on four continents and in, four, in 42 states domestically is and what I hear from people is in the communities that we seek to serve, just a few decades ago, you were able to live a working class or a middle, or a middle class lifestyle, feed your family, if you had a high school degree and you know one skill that you could use repetitively over a period of decades. Today, that simply doesn't exist. And I think that there's a lot of agita and a lot of fear in what, were, what have historically been America's low income and working class communities. And if the world is flat, if, if globalization is, as Congressman Larson put it, the new reality, then what should we as leaders and what should Congress as policymakers do to sort of to intentionally focus on America's low income and working class communities to ensure that people have the skills and the tools to compete in, in today and tomorrow's economy. The need case. The need case is obvious. And I could give data points from, from today through lunch about how access to a computer among America's young people is no longer a competitive advantage. It's a, it's a baseline necessity. Uh, more than 80% of all K through eighth graders, forget about high school for a second, K kindergarten through eighth graders get school assignments that require internet use. I used to make a sort of snarky comment that if you didn't have access to a computer and the skills to use it, you better have a strong wrist because you're going to grow up and flip burgers. And I had to stop saying that because a couple months ago McDonald's announced that it was joining the more than the rest of 80% of America's Fortune 500 companies that would only accept resumes online. So the opportunity to flip burgers in today's economy is being diminished if you aren't online. And then the last piece of data I want to share about the need is I don't, I don't consider myself, you know, somebody who often talks about when I was a kid. But, I'm in my 30s, and I remember when I applied for college, not that long ago, when I applied to college, I would stick a very thick envelope in the mail. And I hopefully would get a very thick envelope in the mail back. <laughs> um, those don't exist anymore. The fat envelopes are gone. If you are a high school senior and you want to go to college, if you want to go to community college, you upload your recommendations, your grades, your application electronically. And what this means is that if you go to poor communities around the country, and I see it all the time, go into a predominantly African American community in the fall, in the spring, and look at how many high school seniors are in the libraries applying for college. You cannot even begin to compete, much less get a competitive advantage if you don't have access to computers in this day and age. So the opportunity, you know, I think I, Simon, I, I give a lot of credit to for putting together a, what they call a series of modest proposals. Because I think a lot of the time we try to tackle the big ideas and we should. We should tackle the, the problem of having 47 million Americans who are uninsured. But I think one of the things, one of the things that we've lost since um, the Clinton administration is our ability to focus on a specific, definable problem that can be solved 
without getting all of our battleships in the water, literally and figuratively. And so one of the things, so with Rob's proposal, you can see that what is an essentially a rounding error in our budget can solve a significant problem. And so what Simon and I wrote in, in our recently issued paper is a concept of getting a laptop in the backpack of every American sixth grader. And we did the math on this, and we learned that for the cost of about a week and a half in Iraq, we could give away a free laptop to every sixth grader in America with all of the supports and all of the training that anybody would need for the, for the young person, him or herself. And, you know, it's, it's actually jarring a little bit when you think about how easy that is. And what this oftentimes prompts people's responses is one, well, that seems really obvious, but two, you know, gee, what are people, you know, what does it mean for somebody to get a laptop in their backpack? Are, get, are they going to know how to use it? Um, are they going to use it for educational purposes or are they going to use it just to, to check sports scores? And so that's where the, one, the work of One Economy comes in and where a lot of data comes in, which I think it's important for people to familiarize themselves with. You know, since One Economy was founded in a basement um, seven years ago my, by myself and three other colleagues, what we've done is we've taken what was initially a belief that if we gave people access to the tools of the digital age, that they would use it for their, in their own self-interest and for the right reasons. And what we now know is last month we passed our 10 millionth person um, who have used our educational online resources and our 300,000th person to whom we've brought broadband and computers into their homes. And what we've seen is, to put this very crassly, is the, the lower your household income is and the more melanin in your skin, the more likely you are to use the internet and computers for educational and asset building purposes. I'm a 35-year-old middle-class white guy. That means that I am statistically the most likely, I, I am statistically the most likely demographic type to use the internet and computers for entertainment, gambling, and pornography. For low-income and working-class Americans, and particularly um, minorities, the data almost inverses. They view computers and internet access as something that's impl more implicitly about education and asset building. And there's a huge amount of data out there by, by Pew and others that affirm that if you br do bring access to the tools of the digital age, people will use it um, for, their ben for their benefit. And I'll, uh, rather than spare you all those, I'll spare you all those data points and, and turn it over to, to Misty to describe that. But just want to close my own remarks in saying that there's actually a consequence to not taking action, to not making sure that our, our community colleges are open and available for people to get technology skills training. There are consequences to not ensuring that all American school children do have laptops in their backpack. And it's not a matter of inconvenience. It's not a matter of people having to go to the library to apply for college. What we're now seeing is one of those traditionally malignant things about America, which is economic stratification taking place based on somebody's skin color and based on the community that they grew up on, grew up in taking place right now in the information technology sector and in jobs that require technology skills, which are, as Rob described, those that are, that are increasingly competitive and, and well-paying. And so without really thinking about it, counties like Montgomery County and Fairfax County and others where the access to the tools of the digital age are ubiquitous, where they're used, where they're integrated into the curriculum, those kids are on they're, they're on the moving sidewalk into the 21st century workforce. But within those communities where those old union wage jobs aren't available anymore, they're having to really run to keep up. I'll stop there because some, one of the people who, because I want to introduce one of the people who I think has done some of the most impressive work actually responding to these series of challenges. Um, that's Misty Chase, the director of the Beyond Tobacco program. Very briefly about Misty, um, in what was termed the, the flood of the century in 1999, Misty and her husband lost their, uh, lost their business and, 
and, and suffered some damage to their home. And after that, Misty went to work for the state government to do um, flood recovery work and became a certified housing counselor after that and became aware of the needs in her home county, uh, Greene County, North Carolina, which is the second most tobacco dependent county in the United States. And Misty and other stakeholders from Greene County came to one economy a number of years ago to say, look, you know, generations of flu cured tobacco farmers have made their living in, in, in Greene County, but we know that technology is changing the world around us and we want to do something about it. And so in an extraordinarily short period of time, Misty and the public and private sector leaders and the school district in Greene County have done some wonderful things to ensure that their students can succeed in, t in tomorrow's economy. So, Misty Chase.